I'm just going to read you the beginning of the Butterfly Lion. It's quite interesting because I wrote this and it's very much about me, if you can imagine me being in the story when I was a little boy. Because when I was a little boy, I was sent away to school, a long way away. And um, I ran away from school and that comes into the story. And the first chapter is called Chillblains and Semolina Pudding. I wonder if you know what chillblains are. Some of you will, but most of you won't. Chillblains is when you get really itchy toes. And usually it's because they're very cold and then they get hot. And somehow the blood circulation doesn't work and you just want to itch and itch and itch forever. Most people now live in fairly warm houses, but in those days when I was young, the houses were very, very cold and people would get chillblains in their fingers and their toes all the time. And the other part of the... Um, title of the first chapter is Semolina Pudding, and I bet you don't have much of that either. Utterly disgusting. That's what they used to serve us up at school with the whole time, Semolina Pudding. Aren't you lucky you, you're a kid now, not when I was a kid. Anyway, here's the beginning of The Butterfly Lion. Chillblains and Semolina Pudding. Butterflies live only short lives. They flower and flutter for just a few glorious weeks, and then they die. To see them, you have to be in the right place at the right time. And that's how it was when I saw the butterfly lion. I happened to be in just the right place at just the right time. I didn't dream him. I didn't dream any of it. I saw him blue and shimmering in the sun one afternoon in June when I was young. A long time ago, but I don't forget. I mustn't forget. I promised them I wouldn't. I was ten and away at boarding school in deepest Wiltshire. I was far from home and I didn't want to be. It was a diet of Latin and stew and rugby and detentions and cross country runs and chillblains and marks and squeaky beds and semolina pudding. And then there was Basha Beaumont, who terrorised and tormented me, so that I lived every waking moment of my life in dread of him. I had often thought of running away, but only once ever plucked up the courage to do it. I was homesick after a letter from my mother. Basha Beaumont had cornered me in the boot room and smeared black shoe polish in my hair. I had done badly in a spelling test, and Mr Carter had stood me in the corner with a book on my head all through the lesson, his favourite torture. I was more miserable than I'd ever been before. I picked at the plaster in the wall and determined there and then that I would run away. I took off the next Sunday afternoon. With any luck, I wouldn't be missed till supper. And by that time, I'd be home, home and free. I climbed the fence at the bottom of the school park, behind the trees where I couldn't be seen. Then I ran for it. I ran as if bloodhounds were after me, not stopping till I was through Innocence Breach and out onto the road beyond. I had my escape all planned. I would walk to the station, it was only five miles or so, and catch the train to London. Then I'd take the underground home. I'd just walk in and tell them I was never, ever going back. There wasn't much traffic, but all the same, I turned up the collar of my raincoat so that no one could catch a glimpse of my uniform. It was beginning to rain now, those hard, heavy drops that mean there's more of the same on the way. I crossed the road and ran along the wide grass verge under the shelter of the trees. Beyond the grass verge was a high brick wall, much of it covered in ivy. It stretched away into the distance, continuous as far as the eye could see, except for a massive arched gateway at the bend of the road. A great stone lion bestrode the gateway. As I came closer, I could see he was roaring in the rain, his lip curled, his teeth bare. I stopped and stared up at him for a moment. That was when I heard a car slowing down behind me. I did not think twice. I pushed open the iron gate, darted through and flattened myself behind the stone pillar. And I watched the car until it disappeared round the bend. To be caught would mean a caning. Four strokes, maybe six across the back of the knees. Worse, I will be back at school back to detentions, back to Basher Beaumont. To go along the road was dangerous, too dangerous. I would try to cut across country to the station. It would be longer that way, but far safer. I 
was still deciding which direction to take when I heard a voice from behind me. Who are you? What do you want? I turned. Who are you? She asked again. The old lady who stood before me was no bigger than I was. She scrutinized me from under the shadow of her dripping straw hat. She had piercing dark eyes that I did not want to look into. I didn't think it would rain, she said, her voice gentler. Lost, are you? I said nothing. She had a dog on a leash at her side, a big dog. There was an ominous growl in his throat, and his hackles were up all along his back. She smiled. The dog says you're on private property, she went on, pointing her stick at me accusingly. She edged aside my raincoat with the end of her stick. <clears throat> Run away from that school, did you? Well, if it's anything like it used to be, I can't say I blame you. But we can't just stand here in the rain, can we? You'd better come inside. We'll give him some tea, shall we, Jack? Oh, don't you worry about Jack. He's all bark and no bite. Looking at Jack, I found that hard to believe. And so this old lady takes the little boy into her great big house and tells him a story. And it's a story of the butterfly lion. Hope you enjoy the rest of the book. Bye-bye.